Well, good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Good to be here this morning. And uh, as we continue our lessons into this idea of seeing Jesus clearly, getting a better picture of who he is. Not that we don't already uh, know him in some ways, but we can always know more. And that's kind of the idea behind this. We can always uh, look at him from a different perspective, look at him from a different uh, set of scriptures and see what we can see uh, that maybe we didn't see as clearly before. And so that's what we're hoping to do out of this as we uh, do this. Also, don't forget these uh, will also kind of coincide with what we're doing in our life groups on Sunday nights as well. So uh, they're uh, not a perfect uh, overlap, so that hopefully you get something different out of each experience. But if you're not a part of one of the life groups, you can see Neil. He'll be able to get you plugged in with one of those as well on Sunday evenings uh, for the most part. I think that's when the majority of them meet a few uh, Sunday afternoon. All right, so uh, as we look at Jesus, the victorious king, uh, looking at this, uh, this concept, again, it helps if I... Turn it on. There we go. Works better with the power on. It's amazing. Uh, so Jesus is the embodiment of the king. And when you look at who the king is, Jesus embodies that. Uh, he, is, uh, he is what God always knew his people needed. The, the problem was prior to that, they wanted a king when they didn't necessarily know that, uh, um, that Jesus was on the way. You know, the, we talked about that when we talked about Jesus as being the Messiah. They didn't have a clear picture of what was coming. Uh, you, you go prior to the cross, specifically back into the Old Testament, and there was this thought of who the Messiah might be that eventually developed into a very different picture of what they thought they needed as a king. But what we're going to focus in on today is the way that Jesus meets our need as a victorious king. Uh, they didn't understand what they were thinking of victory doesn't match up with what we know his victory to be. They didn't understand on how he would be their king because the picture they had in it had been basically crafted around this idea of an earthly king, and this desire that they had that showed itself in the early part of the, uh, uh, the, the story of God's people. I mean, in the early days after the end of the judges, they started getting this desire that they wanted to be like the other countries that surrounded them. They looked at them and the way that their kings led them into battle, and the way that the, their kings led them in that way, and that's what they had decided they wanted to have as well, and so they were looking for that earlier than the appointed time. And this starts back in 1 Samuel 8, probably the beginning of the biggest I told you so story in all of scripture is when the Israelites were hoping to be able to convince Samuel to appoint for them a king. So when Samuel grew old as the last of the, of the judges, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second was Abijah, and they uh, served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. And that's really where you can kind of see where their desire was on that. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, it is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. What they didn't realize is during the time of the judges, the reason they didn't have a king is because they had a king. The entire time, they had God as their king. Not in the sense that they wanted it to look like as the one who was there embodied in front of them as their king. So as they've done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots. And horses. They will run in front of his chariots, which obviously is probably the most dangerous place you can place yourself in that combat situation. Some will, he will assign to be the commander of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. 
He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage he, and, uh, and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from your king or from the king uh, you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. In other words, be warned. You better know what you're asking for. You look at these other nations, look at what they have to go through. You're going to be going through the exact same thing. You have a great king, but instead, you want a king, you'll get a king. And here's what you're going to get out of that king. And when you don't like that king, don't come crying to me. And that, that is 1 Samuel chapter 8. You know, and so it continues with the people refuse to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go before us and fight our battles. And so when Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. And the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. <laughs> so I've heard enough. And that, that kind of ends that. And they seek out a king, which we know the rest of that story. We can probably name two good kings in the entire history. Even when the kingdom gets divided, uh, there is, you know, one line has terrible kings entirely. The other one has a couple of decent ones. Um, obviously, David was pretty good. Beyond that, Elements of Solomon were okay, and then you get two more decent ones with Hezekiah and Josiah. That's about it. Uh, besides that, you're really not going to be looking at many good kings out of all the rest of them. And it was a, a large amount of time of regret uh, from what they had done. God had always been the king to his people. And even during the time of the New Testament, we still see that he makes us a part of his kingdom. And that's why it's such an important concept of which he wants us to wrap our, his mind around. When, when even Christ was not yet here, uh, and John the Baptist was out uh, proclaiming it. It was always about this kingdom that was coming. So God appoints his son to lead us as a servant king, going before us into a battle as well. Much of what they wanted is going to be answered, except we're not going to be like the other nations. That's where it's different. It's going to look different on that. He's going to conquer the things that could cause us the most fear, but at the same time, not necessarily what we had thought it was going to look like, and certainly not what they thought at that time. In Matthew chapter 4, from that time on, Jesus began to rep uh, pre preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And that is really where, as he was continuing to, to teach the people, it was always this concept that he wanted to kind of drill down into their minds of what was happening. The kingdom is coming to you. This kingdom that has always been sought by God's people of how can we have a king? You know, what, who's going to be our king? The kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make, I send you out to fish for people or become fishers of men as some of the versions read. And we know that passage, but what he's really saying is look at the comparison of what we saw back in Samuel. In Samuel, it was if you appoint for yourself a king, you're going to be put out in front of the chariots. You're going to be building things for the, the warfare, or you're going to be in the warfare, or you're going to be a slave, or you're going to be this or that. And instead, here, I will make you profitable in the sense of being fishers of men or fish for, fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Not the warning about what this kingdom would be like under a king, but instead, it's now good news about this type of kingdom. And the healing of every disease and sickness among the people. The people you can see have a totally different treatment under this kingship than the kingship that they sought after prior to that. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea and the region across the Jordan followed him. And this is less about one person getting appointed as a king and rules them with the authority that has been given to them and drives them into submission. 
as we saw before. But instead, now, we see a king from among the people calling them into a kingdom that is better. Calling them and and inviting them in rather than forcing them into labor or forcing them into a position they didn't want. It's an invitation into a position you never thought you could possibly earn. Into a position you never thought you were going to possibly be worthy of having. All throughout Christ's ministry, we see this, this concept of the kingdom, but in such a positive light, of the, or uh, even the, the coming kingdom, as we see. We're, there are central messages to what, uh, um, of what it meant to become to him. You, you had to come to this kingdom. It wasn't just coming to Jesus, but it was coming into his kingdom, being kingdom people, being those who are willing to submit to this type of king. When we know our position in the kingdom, it real, we realize uh, a couple things about Christ. First of all, it places him in the proper position as the king. And when we look at this in different places where we see the idea of Jesus being our brother, it's really easy for us to lower Christ down to our level in that way of thinking. But when we understand where he is positioned in the kingdom, we realize that those other passages raise us up to his level rather than lowering him down. There's no lowering down of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that we're going to be able to do that would actually be able to, uh, when we really fully understand him, lower him from the lofty position of which he is deserving and has. There's nothing about what we could study about him to find like, oh, well, this, you know, if Jesus is willing to be joint heirs with us in the inheritance, then he must not be as great as we thought he was. No, he thinks of us as greater than we realized. It's always looking at it from that perspective. In Matthew chapter 5, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I truly, or for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He goes on to say, therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least, where? In the kingdom of heaven. And so again, he talks about this idea of making sure that we're following the way. This, this way into the kingdom isn't because of what land you live in, and it's not by some boundaries that were drawn into who governs you the way that we would be citizens of countries and states and things like that now, but instead, the citizenship of this kingdom has to do with what we choose to do with our lives and how we live our lives and the way that we treat the words of God. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so then he goes on to say, you know those Pharisees, the ones that stand out on the corner bragging about how righteous they are. If your righteousness, which is true righteousness, because you have true righteousness through the one who can make you pure, that, those rights that we took this morning as we took the emblems of what, uh, what Christ's body does for us, It washes us back to purity. It gives us a cleansing that is a righteousness that can't be obtained any other way on earth. And he says, when you have that righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees, that's what it's going to take to enter into this kingdom and into that eternal part of this kingdom. It's kind of weird because we have this current version of it. And we have the coming portion of the kingdom, which is still yet to come, as we don't see yet Christ sitting on that throne, reigning fully over his kingdom until we're brought into it in its full. But we're already members of that kingdom. And it's one of those hard to wrap your mind around where we have one foot in that other spiritual realm and one foot still planted into this physical realm. But until we're fully into that spiritual realm and can see the fully entirety of that kingdom, then we can fully understand some of these passages of what they truly mean. But he goes on, he says, and a few chapters later, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, he'd already told them about obedience and how when you follow God's word, it makes you great in the kingdom. And when you encourage others or yourself are disobedient and you encourage others to be disobedient, it makes you least in the kingdom. And he already talked about the importance of following God's words, holding on to what God's word says. And so then they asked, who's the greatest? They should have already known this answer. He called a little child to them. 
It placed the little child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And he keeps reminding them, you have to be different. You can't let it all be about you being the one driving the bus. But instead, you have to sometimes take your seat back in the bus and let God do the, the, the leading. Learn how to truly be a follower again. Learn how to let someone else lead you. That can be a difficult thing as we, you know, as we grow and we age and we become more accustomed to being the one that has to make choices and being the one that has to make decisions. And some of us take on positions at work in which we're the boss and we have to make those decisions and we have to make the calls and we have to do all that. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, but remember, you have to become like a child and learn how to follow again. Learn how to be led instead of be the leader. Be led by him and submit. That's a hard one, right? <laughs> that means giving up sometimes what you would choose and do what he needs you to do or wants you to do or what he's called you to do. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we're right back to obedience. It keeps coming back to that theme of obedient, obedient, obedient. That is how we submit to this king. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So when we know that God desires for us to be uh, a part of him, we know I mean, every bit of the, the story, we, we talk about how the entirety of scripture is a love story, about how God wants his people to come back. Um, it is both, you know, he, he wants us to both father and son role to be the king of our lives. You know, in the Old Testament, we see it more as the father role of the king. In the New Testament, we see more of Jesus being in that position as the king. So much so that when he goes to the cross, you know, and he, he's made to answer that claim. Do you claim to be the king of the Jews? And he says, it is as you're saying. You, know, you said it with your own mouth. And they put the sign behind him and they crucify him with that. Uh, we know that when Jesus comes and he proclaims that the kingdom of heaven had come through him, which was the, the central message of it, which when we really understand that, it helps us to understand how the entirety of scripture comes in, that it, he is already reigning in his kingdom. He has to be, because if he's not reigning in his kingdom, then when he said the kingdom is coming through me, and it didn't, that would make him wrong. And we know that's not true. So we know that he's reigning in his kingdom right now. We don't have to worry about a later date in which he finally gets to take the throne over. He is reigning as our king right now. At some point in time, we all get gathered up together. Passages like 1 Thessalonians 4 are pretty descriptive of how that's going to happen when he comes back and he meets us in the air and we're gathered back together. And then we get to that point where we get to be into that eternal portion of it. But he keeps telling us about how the kingdom was coming through him. We can look back at Daniel. And Daniel and the, the prophecies, particularly Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 10, several different ones that will go through. And we see this idea of an establishment of a kingdom by God, not by humans, by God during a time of the Roman Empire. And we see all of that taking place during this. And we can look back and realize that God established the kingdom of heaven during that time. While it had, he was their king before, as his people reigning over them, he established this new kingdom that we all get to be a part of. It's the eternal kingdom uh, that comes in through that time period. And we see that taking place. So we look at it. So where's the victory part? If you notice, I said we'd be focusing in on the victory. And I've not yet used the word victory. Because we've been talking about who the king is and what they thought the king might be and, and how he fits in as our king. But when you look at the cross, you know, how could this be victory? And we understand it, but how did they understand that at that time? They looked at it, and they looked at it as finality. They looked at it as loss. They looked at it as the Romans won, and we've lost. And everything that we were striving for, because their minds had not yet wrapped through their themselves around this idea that this is not an earthly land-based kingdom the way that we have in many places in the world, whether it's countries or kingdoms or whatever, these empires, this is not what it was going to be. It's different. And they hadn't yet wrapped their mind around it. So when they looked at the cross, they saw uh, you know, loss and, and complete, utter failure. Although a few days later, a handful of them get to see what it really meant. And then that news began to proclaim 
to more and more people what was really meant by that cross, this idea that God had surpassed this idea. And the victory that he claims over us uh, is one that is a victory we wouldn't have ever even dreamt of. Better than it could have been of knocking out the Romans. We see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, talking about his earthly existence, now, after the cross, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So that now the death doesn't have its painful sting to it. It doesn't have its finality it used to have. It doesn't have the, the uh, you know, overriding fear that it may still have over the world who doesn't have the hope in Jesus Christ. The idea of someone in the world dying has got to be a scary, scary thought because it is the end and everything you'd worked for ends and is over. But here in this kingdom, it restarts it into an even better version of itself. And so in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And a little bit later in that same chapter, he says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's the kind of message we need to be out proclaiming to the world. Read that last line and understand that is exactly the description of the way the world views death even today. They live their entire lives in slavery to the fear of dying. We saw without unequivocally played itself out over the last three years how many people lived afraid to die. That it was, that there was, and, and granted, nobody's, out trying to die. But they understand that like, there were a lot of people who were so gripped with fear over what if I succumb to an illness? What if I, whatever. And then this can't get out of their psyche anymore and they're enslaved to this idea that death is the end. When in fact, in Christ, it is not the end. There is no sting to it. It's painful for those who have to endure it from this side and have to go through the loss and the grief from this world's perspective. But there's a peace that overcomes all of that, particularly for the one who might actually be the one dying. That there is this knowing that on the other side, things continue to get better for them. And we see this played out in 1 Corinthians 15. As Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, talking to them about the eternal things, and, and the things of, you know, that will continue on. He says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. That same description that's given to the church at Thessalonica is given again here. The dead are rising, we're all changed, we get to be brought into this imperishable part of the kingdom at that point. And he goes on to say, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will become true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And there's where the victory of our king comes in. There is no more true death. Oh yeah, we have a physical death. It's a passing. And that, you know, probably the best way we could ever describe someone's dying is they've passed on to something even better. They've moved on. They've stepped up. <laughs> they've gone up to the next, you know, better part of what it's like to be a part of having Jesus as our king. The victory he brings to us isn't going to be a land grab here on earth. It never will be. There's never going to be a time that we have to be overly wrapped our minds around concerned with that the world isn't matching up to what God wants it to be. His people are members of a kingdom that we need to make sure that kingdom stays focused and dedicated to serving 
him as our king. And when we do it through that obedience, not only do we get to enter in, but he makes those of us who can make ourselves as, as submissive and obedient to him the greatest in that kingdom. And the things he has waiting for us there, this imperishable, this immortality, those words alone are good, but it gets even better. And I feel like this becomes one of those infomercial moments where it's, you know, everyone in the crowd's yelling, more, more. Oh, there's more. We'll take off one page. No. <laughs> but the idea is, you know, this idea of everything that we have, the streets of gold, the home with him, the fact that we get to live in heaven with him in God's presence for eternity, and that there is no more fear. There is no more dying. There is no more pain. There is no, nothing else. All of that goes away, and it vanishes away as he brings us home into that eternal portion of our kingdom. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the victory comes through obedience, turning to him, first in that first step of accepting him as your king, so that you die to this world and be brought into his kingdom. You, know, you, you go through that, that process of believing in him and, and confessing that he is your Lord, he's your savior, he's your king. You, you repent from the ways you used to live. You're willing to die to your old self so that you can get rid of that and clothe yourself with him so that one day he'll bring you home and clothe you with imperishable immortality. If there's anything that we can do this morning to help you make that choice and decision to follow him, or if you need any of the prayers of anyone here this morning or collectively of the church, you can come this morning as we stand and sing, and we can pray for you on, on your behalf. If any needs you have, come as we stand and sing.